they put this film together. Um, so, the first question would be, Trisha, since you are the director of this film, how did, how did this project get started? So, as you'll notice, the first scene of the film starts off with Jordan and his family in 2015. And that scene surprises a lot of people because Jordan came out with his videos in 2016 and uh, the, the Professor Against Political Correctness video. So that's kind of the start to a lot of this for many people. But we, were, uh, we had started filming with Jordan a year and a half before that, actually. So I've known about Jordan's work for many years, since probably 2003, back when I was a psychology undergraduate student at a nearby university to where he was teaching. And I came across his book, Maps of Meaning, and I found it really fascinating. It, it's back when I was in my stage of studying, I was studying psychology, I was taking a lot of philosophy classes, and I was asking all the big existential questions, so it was the perfect thing to land on for me at that time. And I had the thought of making a film about him for many years, um, because I was especially interested in not only the ideas, but also the person behind the ideas, because in his introduction to Maps of Meaning, he talks about having had these profound nightmares as a teenager, and they were about the end of the world. And he was trying to understand the nature of evil, and this question, it's this big question, but it's also something that was so personal to him. So I thought, well, there's something really interesting here that, that I want to try to understand. So I finally approached him in 2015 about the idea of making a film. And I started at that point making a film that was completely, completely different. So the film at that point was focusing on Jordan's friendship with Indigenous Carver, Charles Joseph. So you'll notice in his home, in a lot of photos and um, videos of Jordan in his home, you'll see Native artwork in the background. And, uh, and that was mainly done by his friend, Charles Joseph, who's, uh, who lives on the west coast of Canada. And they have been friends for about 15 years now. Charles is this raw artist. He's a residential school survivor. So Canada has this dark history of um, taking, this, this used to happen, doesn't happen anymore, thank God. Um, young kids, native kids, were taken from their families at a young age and they were put into these schools and they weren't allowed to speak their language, um, their hair was cut off, they couldn't see their families, and, um, and Charles was sexually abused and this happened a lot. And that happened for eight years he was in the school, so he lived this you know, life of trauma that he was trying to overcome. And um, later, he went back to his traditions, his carving, the music, the stories, and it's been extremely healing for him. And uh, Charles and Jordan, they really complement each other in interesting ways, and Charles's family was adopting Jordan uh, as part of their family. And part of this was because Jordan was building a third floor in his home modeled after an indigenous longhouse. And there are carvings that Charles included um, on totem poles and masks as part of this, uh, uh, this third floor. And he had to get permission from his chiefs and from elders and his family, because there's all this protocol you have to follow. This stuff is really sacred. And uh, so as part of that, Jordan was being adopted. He was given a name in Kwakwala, that's Charles's language. So for a year and a half, this is the film I was focusing on. So it was completely different. And then Jordan released those videos, and suddenly everything changed. There's rallies happening on campus, and all this news coming out. And I started filming these other things that were taking place. And within a couple weeks, I realized I need to put what I was doing on hold and make a completely different film here to try to make sense of all of this. And we do intend on going back and finishing that film. It's called Mechala, which in Kwakala means to dream. So once, uh, once this tour is over, we'll go back and finish that film. that one, no. Yeah, so you kind of just picked it up and just transformed it, you adapted to it. Mm -hmm. wow. And so, I think the biggest question probably everybody has is, has Jordan Peterson seen this film and what does he think about it? Yeah, so it was, um, I guess it was August, yeah. Trisha. So, obviously for journalistic integrity, once the film is done, it's picture locked, then you can show it to the people that are in it. So we, um, we showed it to Jordan. It was a bit, um, 
it wasn't totally what we expected because, um, as you know, like throughout the summer, um, Tammy was in the hospital. Um, so that was, um, I mean, what we had to do, we had to roll in the laptop on a cart and, you know, we spent so much time with the sound mix and the color correction and all that stuff, but it ended up just being on the MacBook with like no speakers and we're bedside there with Tammy and uh, Jordan and his mom. So it wasn't the perfect situation, but um, that's, that's what we had to do, even the time frame. And um, yeah, so what we usually do when we watch, watch the, when we show people the film, we watch them watch. And um, yeah, it was certain parts of the film were definitely stressful for him. Um, definitely the part with Bernie, the bald headed guy who actually passed away. Uh, he passed away a few months ago. Um, so it was this conversation that they were never able to have together. Um, and then the part with Tammy was, uh, I think, a very emotional for him. Um, but overall, they respected the film. Uh, I thought it was an honest film, a good portrayal of what happened. Um, and I uh, thought the editing was really good, so it was nice to get that positive feedback. But I also think, like Jordan, um, he needs to kind of take some time away from all of this stuff. And it's kind of like watching a film with your nose against the screen, like he's so close to everything that happened, so it's really hard to make sense of it all. So I think he needs to maybe watch it with some other people, maybe with some family, and uh, take some time away to kind of really make sense of it all. But uh, overall, it was a positive, uh, it, was a, it was a really good night to finally show them what we made with them spending so much time with us um, since 2015. All right, so I want to open it up to the audience members. So again, if you have a question, please uh, line up on the right side the steps, and uh, Dean over here will take your question. Fella or girl ever understand that he was not transphobic? He just was concerned that they were forcing speech. Uh, so La Lane, so the Lane, um, I, I don't know specifically the answer to that, but what I can say is that um, Lane and a friend came over to our place to watch the film. It, back then, it was a TV cut. Um, but it was very similar to this. And the first thing Lane said after the film was, uh, do you think Jordan would have a beer with me? <laughs> uh, and the reason I think, and then we kind of elaborated on that. And um, I think for Lane, it was one of the first times where they heard Jordan speak in his own words about what he thought and what, what he didn't think. Like for example, that one video he made uh, to as a response to the trans teaching early on in the film, um, nobody saw that. Like, it was just was never part of the conversation about Jordan saying, okay, to make it clear, I don't disbelieve in the existence of non binary people. It didn't matter. Um, it was all too polarized, either you're for us or against us, and the nuance gets washed away. Um, so that was nice to hear, just to kind of have Lane and a friend come over to our place. And that was, we were also very nervous, because fundamentally, I mean, it is a Jordan Peterson film. That's what we were doing before it got all political and heated. So that's what we wanted to stick to. But of course, the journey that Jordan took involved some other people that had direct connections with him, or contact and conflict. So, um, so it was nice to hear that. And I would also add that, um, for Lane, I think that because Jordan was opposing this law, and this law was about adding more rights for someone like Lane, who identifies as non-binary, you know, that was seen. There weren't rights for them. They were, uh, they were power. Well, I mean, sir, it, it's complicated, uh, absolutely, and, and I, you know, I know what Jordan was arguing uh, about had to do with. Um, you know, the compelled speech argument, but it, but it was adding, um, the main thing that the law was doing was adding gender identity and gender expression to existing protected human rights categories uh, in Canada. So for, for Lane, um, the fact that Jordan was opposing that, I think just, it, it, it's tough because um, there's the initial video and there's the initial perception of that and then there's like all these complicated details and there's all these media articles that portray all of this so differently. And the other thing that I would say is, 
I think uh, as time went on, especially after the first year or so, um, Jordan became clearer in his argument. Like in the earlier days, he was saying, I won't use those words. And later he said, I might use those words and would acknowledge like there are some people who, who I would or I might use those words for um, if he doesn't feel like it's a political power play, but it is personal. So I think you know the, that makes a, a big difference, that kind of nuance. Um, but earlier on, it was hard to get that, and things became so politicized and polarized. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know for sure what uh, what Lainey thinks about it today. Thank you. Hi. Uh, what's the expected kind of timeline that this would be released that anybody would be able to watch the film? Uh, the 29th, is that tomorrow? That is tomorrow. <laughs> uh, it's, so last I checked it was number one on iTunes pre-order and it comes out officially tomorrow on iTunes across the states and it's available for pre-order internationally and internationally it comes out on November 8th. And then uh, Amazon Prime and all the top ones, uh, uh, Google Play, all the top people. Oh, for Netflix. Yeah, and then Netflix, we have our fingers crossed to get that on there. I listened to the wonderful podcast interview you guys did with Wired. Awesome. Highly recommended. Very good. You. Uh, you captured some excellent interview moments here, uh, particularly with the mask. It was delightful. I know you spent a lot of time with um, Dr. Peterson, but how do you go about prepping for your interviews? Uh, do you warm up the subject? Um, do you feel like there's a right or a wrong way to do that? Can you over, over warm up, overdo that process? And uh, was there any, any techniques or any uh, tips or tricks you ended up using that were uh, productive? I typically didn't do warm up with Jordan. No, it, with with him, it was best to uh, to just keep it fresh um, and have the camera rolling. Um, he also got very used to us being around. And actually, I think the best technique overall for the doc documentary was to just kind of be a house plant in the room and for them to forget that we were there, so that it would just be these more authentic moments. I really don't like contrived documentaries. Um, so that's a lot of what my style is about. The name Holding Space Films comes from the term holding space. It's used a lot in the facilitation world, the group facilitation, and it's about a, a specific type of listening where you're kind of listening on all the levels, like to the words somebody is saying, you're listening on the emotional level, and you're just like really kind of being opening up a container for someone to share their experience in an authentic way. So I would say that's um, the style that I strive for. Um, when when I'm interviewing someone that I'm less that doesn't know me as well, um, if they're not as used to being on camera, then the warm up stuff would help for sure. At least just having conversation, you know, before we kind of get started, just to ease the nerves. So it depends on you know how much experience someone has with the camera and how much they know you and where their comfort level is at. Hi, thanks uh, for making this uh, enjoyable film. I really liked it. Um, so I'm not really good at coming up with questions on uh, in the, this amount of time, so I'm going to try to phrase this as well as I can. Um, so you know, spending time with Peterson and, and kind of um, you know having the experience you'd had with him that you described before, where you know you'd known him about him since like the early 2000s, and then getting to go to some of his classes, deciding to make. Uh, the original documentary and then moving on to, to this documentary, um, you know, uh, kind of being involved or at least being in the background when this, this frenzy came to be and, um, you know, there was just all this, I guess you'd call it excitement and, um, you know, uh, in, in the media and, and, and uh, you know, just um, and all, all this political dialogue, I guess, um, you know, my question to you is, you know, how is this, has this had an impact on, you know, you see this kind of stuff uh, this kind of stuff happen um, maybe on TV, but to actually be in it, has this, ha has this changed the way you maybe view the world in some aspect or view some aspect of the world or has it expanded some way of, uh, some part of the way you see it? Um, 
Uh, sorry if that's not very clear. Uh, okay. Well, working on this film, I think for both of us, has um, created a lot of changes. I mean, it was surprising, it was unexpected. This is my first feature film, so there's a ton of growth that came from working on this on many levels. Um, you know, just as a filmmaker and um, from a business perspective, having to step up and learn so many things. Like when I first started uh, in 2015, I hadn't been just even shooting with a camera since grad school. So I literally, you know, after we had our, our meetings with Jordan, we decided, okay, we're going to focus on, on you and Charles. I bought a camera and I bought a plane ticket. I went to uh, Vancouver Island, which is where Charles was, and I was like, all right, so let's do this. So I've come a long way. Um, but also, politically, it, it, um, it forced me to consider some things that I wasn't really thinking about in terms of political correctness, in terms of... Um, the dangers of when social justice can go too far. I was in my own kind of liberal bubble of not thinking about um, when, when um, you know, the, I guess, totalitarian aspects of when, um, when those demands can go too far. I wasn't really awake to it, I guess I would say, even though it was bubbling up in culture. Um, there's probably more you can add to that. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's kind of like thinking about, you know, the default arguments or default positions that you kind of just take from mainstream and uh, challenging them and just seeing what stands. Definitely echo that. To that, I would add, though, uh, what did I learn through all this? I didn't realize how really bad it actually is. Like, man, like, it's really polarized, especially down here. Uh, like, I, like, like, <laughs> There's two people who might live down the street, they live in completely different worlds. They watch different news, they have different perceptions of what actually happened. How can you talk with someone if you don't agree on the facts? If you don't, you, you, you're hearing one side and then there's another side, and it propels on to this thing where the algorithms online will give you that which they know you'll like, so it doubles down, triples down, comes to a point where even the exposure of what the other guy thinks pisses you off and you'll just go further into your hole and you'll continue to vilify them. There's certain parts in this film, I think for some people, they're like, oh, what the hell, you know? But um, that's what I think I learned. I, I guess what I learned is how, how bad the flow of information has become and how politicized really everything is. Um, and I guess that's why it's so much more important the way we made the film, where I can stand by this thing and just say that this isn't a, this isn't an ideological film. It's not really telling you what to think. It's not an advocacy film. It's a human film. And the more we can see the other side um, across the pond, across the aisle, as human beings, the better we'll be able to understand them and to form a language that we can all speak. Thank you. We got that from the film. This was a film that really, it did not demonize the other side, even though, you know, you might agree or disagree with them, but still, you know, this is a human film, just about the man himself. Uh, thanks for coming out to Texas to show your film. I was just wondering what your intention was for the film. And then how can we, as the audience who have seen this and uh, have been impacted by Jordan's work, go out and make a real difference and kind of carry on his message in, in, in our own lives and throughout uh, society? Uh, great question. I don't think everybody's really asked that. That's a good one. Um, we try to answer that without people asking it. Um, I guess I would throw back kind of one of Jordan's ideas that I really like. Uh, speaks to that kind of mythology. The most interesting people are the people that go across borders. And I mean that in a symbolic, metaphysical way. They're the type of people that speak, that understand different accents and can, um, can almost chameleon their way into other tribes to be able to understand the way they think. And then to bring back the treasure back to your own home base, your lair, and to pick out the parts of what they're, how they're living and what they say and build it into your own. I think those are the most interesting people. Um, it's the exact opposite of tribalism. Uh, we all understand our tribe, we all understand that that's 
really it's really biological. You grow up with people who talk like you, dress like you, think like you, um, have the same passport. But I think that the, once you get to a certain age, and uh, you know you're done your undergrad, and then you're out in the world, I really think that the the folks that are the most interesting are able to transcend and play with the border a little bit, like a trickster, like a trickster archetype. So um, that's why the film is a bit like a roller coaster. It's not totally feel good. Um, parts of it, you know, you're shifting your weight in your seat. Parts of it, you're like, yeah, get them, you know. But fundamentally, kind of, that's what kind of real life is like. And um, and we were talking about this before here. It's kind of like when people go see films these days, it's all about fantasy, because real life is so messy and so challenging and so confusing. So you want to see a superhero movie. And even documentaries, it's like, people make documentaries these days as if they're fiction, you know? If, why would I listen to the sentence that you're starting to say if I know how you're going to end it, you know? It's the same thing with docs. It's like, we, we're, we don't make fiction, you know? We make documentaries and journalists and you know, artists, I mean, they're, they're not necessarily your friends. They're people that are going to tell you something that may challenge you, ideally in an artful way, in a way that you'll remember, you know, we love those kind of films where you watch it last night, you wake up in the morning, you got your head under the shower head, and it still lingers in you. It's like, oh, well, that's, what about that? And okay, that's, that's a, that kind of challenge, this and that. So, so I guess I would say the advice would be, try to be one of those people that travels, and I mean that, and I mean that very broadly in every sense of the word. Very Peterson ask answer. Thank you and uh, keep the great work and look forward to the next film. Thank you, sir. First, I want to say thank you for making an excellent film. And my question is, um, one of the things that Peterson said that really stuck with me, and I'm glad you included it in the film, was that the message he wanted to convey to his students was that if they had lived in Nazi Germany, they probably would have been Nazis. And then that for me connects with another part of the documentary that is the people who know Jordan who talk about that hazard of the fame and the public perception. And you also talk about how when he was five he wanted to have a JFK funeral. All of this for me culminated in a big question mark at the end of the film of is he going down that road and is he aware of that hazard? He seems like the kind of man who would be, but I'm curious, since you have had a lot of experience with him, and I imagine he's probably mentioned this at some point, what are his thoughts about whatever truth there is to his susceptibility to demagoguery and whether he thinks that is happening to him? I think he's absolutely uh, aware of the dangers of that, for sure, and he has been throughout all of this. Um, and, uh, and, and we made sure to include parts of that in the film because it, it's a tension that he's been facing. Uh, I think his family helps to keep him grounded. Um, they're number one for him and they like to tease him a lot. <laughs> so uh, they'll prevent his ego from inflating too much. Um, so I don't think uh, I don't think he's going down that road, but it's it's a risk, and um, you know it's been this crazy roller coaster, and uh, and I think he's needed some time to step back and reflect and process on what all of this has meant for him. He's needed that for a long time, and he's finally taking that time now. It's unfortunate it's health issues that have forced him to uh, take a break, but um, but I'm glad he's taking that much needed time. Thank you. Two things. First of all, if you know, is he okay? He's okay. He's not out of the thick of things yet. Um, uh, for those of you that haven't seen Michaela's video yet, uh, while well, so Tammy, is, as Mass was mentioning earlier, Tammy was in the hospital, in and out of the hospital for the last six months. Tammy is better now. They removed the cancer. They resolved the complications from her surgery, so Tammy's doing a lot better. During that time, Jordan went on uh, anti-anxiety medication that's strong and uh, that really messed with him. Um, and he, when he went off that medication, it messed with him even more, and he checked into rehab about a month and a half or so ago. 
Um, and then they also realized more recently that he was having an allergic reaction to the medication. So he called us maybe four or five days ago, just kind of out of the blue, wanting to check in and see how the tour was going. And uh, we hadn't heard from him in a while, so that was great to hear his voice. And I asked him, how are you doing? He said, I'm about neck deep in hell, so he's still in it. But he said, you know, my, my head is out of it, so that gave me enough strength to call you and to ask how things are going. And I let him know that at every single Q&A, people are always asking how he's doing and really sending their support to him. The other question is, compared to when you started in 2015, how is this project looking for you economically? <laughs> well, when I started, uh, it was basically self-funded, so I would do other video projects, and then I would just do this, you know, from funding from that, basically. Um, and then in summer 2017, we actually got some proper funding from uh, the CBC in Canada, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. So that was amazing. We, we were able to actually hire a team. Um, and have that support. So uh, that's where a lot of our, the majority of our funding came from, as well as some other Canadian grants. And then um, we, we got a distributor in the US and internationally, Gravitas and Sideways Films. And so that helped uh, with some of the funding for this version of the film. And uh, we're hoping that uh, iTunes and whatever else comes after can help fill in any of the last gaps. Well, thanks for doing this, and I wish you, you great success with that. Thank you. So, um, obviously spending a lot of time around him, uh, filming him and whatnot, you're exposed to a lot of his ideas throughout, you know, a long period of time. So my question to you is, um, you know, while filming him and spending all this time around him, are there any ideas that he had that maybe you realized you would vehemently disagree with him on? And uh, how do you handle that while filming? Do you just kind of stay out of it, or do you discuss it with him? Um, how does that work? Yeah, let me think about one. Okay. Um, I would say when when he first made those videos, there was a lot to unpack. Of, okay, so what is he saying here? What is this really about? I had to. There's so much I had to try to um, understand about the law and dig into that. So. Um, there was a lot of trying to make sense of things, and there was a lot of discomfort for me. Um, like, if I hadn't been in the position I was in when this first started, I wouldn't have chased the film that was about trans pronouns, free speech, um, political correctness, like that, that wouldn't have been my, like, I want to make that film. Um, but I was already there, and, uh, and it was important for me to understand it all. Um, I guess uh, one thing that always comes to mind when people ask me what's something I disagree with him about, I think about there's there's one particular point in the interview, we have a clip of it in the film, the Vice interview about the makeup in the workplace. Um, I, I don't disagree with the larger point that he was making about, you know, he was essentially saying, can we have a, an adult conversation about sexuality in the workplace and sexual display? And, and I get that part, but the, there's just one particular part where the interviewer asks him, do you think a woman is being hypocritical or uh, somewhat hypocritical if she's wearing makeup in the workplace and she doesn't want to be sexually harassed? And Jordan says, uh, I do think that. And I think that's where he takes the argument too far. And I don't even know if he really thinks that or if the, the journalist kind of took him too far because he was really annoyed with that guy. I never had the opportunity to talk to him about it, so I don't know, maybe he does. But um, yeah, that, that was the main part I was thinking of when I brought that question up. But I'll, I'll, I'll let you continue. I just want to mention that. Um, you've you've kind of answered this question to some extent, but I'm just curious. I don't I, I don't know the rest of your work. Is this the biggest you know of uh, film that you've made? You know how does it compare to other films? And uh, you know I suppose you you know it hasn't come out, so the 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 end point is unknown. But just curious how it ranks. So before this, I'd only done short films. Uh, this is my first feature film, so it's definitely the biggest film I've made yet.
and has this huge fan of Jordan's for a long, long time. I probably listened to 300 talks or more. And has this huge fan of Jordan's for a long, long time. I probably listened to 300 talks or more. Um, in your promotion, though, the thing that I would encourage when you're promoting a film. It takes a long time for people to watch to understand, I think, where Jordan's coming from, especially on the right to left battles of people just like you had said earlier, sort of you, people, the tribal, because tribalism scares me more than almost anything. And so I would put together a script where you would talk about the fact that I think Jordan's being very fair on both sides, where he's, you'll get more people to see the film if they get rid of some of the preconceived parts that they've heard about when you're saying, no, 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 he beats up the left as much as he beats up the right. He beats up, he's against totalitarianism, and this is what it's about. And I think that would be important to the end, because I want this film to explode. I'm like, this is crazy. I drive her nuts, because I love what he's trying to do from that point of view of just saying, look, we can break down some of this tribalism. We can go this way. And I'm not on one side, and I'm not on the other. And so just as a part of the promotion, to try to get the people specifically on the left to say, hey, why don't you come watch this thing and just see a little bit of that's different than what you actually believe he's about? The only thing I would say that's tricky about that is we never want to put ourselves in the position where we're speaking for Jordan or his ideas or, or having to defend his ideas. We can defend what we've done in the film and our approaches in the film and all of that, but um, it's very tricky to do that without without speaking for him. And um, yeah, it's been tricky. We, we designed the film so that it would be for a broad audience, whether you're a fan of Jordan or you really dislike what he's doing. Um, and we hope we can eventually reach a broader audience because of course at our screenings, it's mainly Jordan Peterson fans that are coming out. Um, so it has been tricky to reach that other audience for sure. So uh, with the poster, some people ask questions about the poster. What we're trying to do here is kind of try to speak to how the more tribal nature on both sides kind of created the persona of this guy. So on the left, you know, you got Antifa, you got they, them, Button, you got an angry protester, you got kind of the communist red. You got kind of like the guy condemning him while masked. It's like, I get to condemn you, but you don't know who I am. Then on the right, you know, you got the blue, you got the woman trying to grab at him, and she's in awe, you know. And you got the kid over here, he's a really interesting character, this is somebody I see a lot, we met on the tour. He wears Jordan's mask, but he hides behind it. Uh, he kind of, whatever Jordan says, he just kind of says, and he does it to try to win arguments online. And I know because I'm a moderator in the Jordan Peterson Facebook group, so I see that stuff all the time. <laughs> and. Uh, Sanctimonious, like the one guy's arguing with another, one's a little bit more religious, one's a little bit more atheist, and he's like, and they get mad at each other, and they say, you sanctimonious prick. It's like, that's what Jordan said to this other guy, you know? So you're the one who banned me. And then under that, it's kind of hard to see, you got the guy in the dark, he's got kind of the sinister look on his face, and he has a boat uh, button on him. That's kind of like the right wing kind of uh, guy who wants to, you could care less about any of this, he just wants to see how he can use it to his benefit. So you got all these people kind of glorifying and vilifying him, and the scaffolding kind of is creating this persona of this guy who's coming to like a biblical, like either devil or messiah figure, which is stained glass and the lobster at the top and the forbidden fruit. And you got a little frog at the top and uh, not the pepe. And you have the, the, the dragon eating itself. Um, so these are all elements that Jordan plays with. And the point here is that we're trying to talk about how it's society, media, YouTubers, all these folks that kind of created the persona of Jordan and made him much more bigger than what he, um, who he is as a human being. So that's why we want to bring it back home with the film. And I guess to the marketing of the film, I mean, if we did it to market it to more left-wingers, then a lot of you guys wouldn't be here, to be honest with you. Because I'll tell you what happened with our TV cut. This is really interesting, right? We talk about the other side being very tribal and snowflake. Here's what happened to us. We had a CBC cut, uh, we had a TV cut, 44 minutes, the first version of this film that came out in November in Canada. 
and it was called Shut Him Down, The Rise of George Peterson. We, it, we made it very red and black, made it very kind of stark, and we covered his eyes with a black bar. And what we're trying to do there is we're just kind of like it's oxymoron. It's like you shut the guy down, he continues to rise. And the trailer was very bombastic, kind of like the way the trailer is now. We got a bunch of messages online calling us uh, communists and uh, Marxists and, uh, you know, she, we, they thought that we, we wanted to shut down Jordan. It's like, we're trying to shut him down by making a film about him. Like, it was completely <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> you know, it didn't make any sense. And there was a lot of people that were George Peterson fans. So right-wingers, Christians, Jewish people, you know. So they got really sensitive about the fact that we took Jordan and we put him with communist red. I mean, have you guys ever been in this house? The answer to that question is no, we have. It's covered with that stuff. So it's like, we played with the elements that we learned from and experienced with Jordan and we put it in our marketing and it totally got weird online and um, we just screenshotted it at all and had fun with it. And now we're getting it from the left. So for the first cut, we got it from the right. Now we're getting it from the left with these cancellations. So it's like, okay, as artists and filmmakers that really aren't your friends, we think we did the right thing because we we're trying to walk that line. We're trying to play with that border. I mean, you know, you take the red and the blue together, you got purple. We love this meme of this purple pill. It's I like this, I like a little bit of this. I like a little bit of that. So. Marketing a film like this is very hard. You're always going to annoy some people. So we try to walk that balance here with the film. And for some people that were Jordan film, Jordan Pearson fans, they thought the poster was too dark and weirded them out. And they thought it was a hit piece. And, they, and I think some of them didn't give it the time of day until Jordan started tweeting the trailer and explaining, uh, these guys have been filming me for four years, and yada yada. Then they chilled out, and then they left us some messages, kind of apologizing for some of the previous posts. <laughs> but um, I tell you, like um, nobody thinks that their own tribe is a tribe. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks the other side's worse, and uh, that from our point of view, that's really funny and sad at the same time. What I, what I was trying to get you to do, you just did in four minutes. Mm -hmm. So I would say watch this film, and when you describe that poster, and, and that's an easy thing that you could promote, you just did exactly what I wanted you to do. You said, here's what's on the poster, and all you're doing is describing the poster. This is what's happening on the left, this is what's here, just bottle that. Yeah, you're not doing it without buying a poster for me, by the way. <laughs> Some of posters. <laughs> Hi, my name is Adrian. Uh, that was a great film. I really enjoyed it. Um, so you mentioned you started filming in 2015, uh, and 2016 was memorable for all of us, obviously. Um, when did you know that your focus of your film was going to shift from what you mentioned to this just blown up thing in Canada, um, which happened to coincide with this huge thing in the U.S. with Donald Trump being elected? Uh, thank you. I think it hit me when, so I was at the free speech rally, which happened a few days, maybe a week or so after Jordan released the videos. Um, but there's a part that we include in the film where Lane confronts Jordan uh, about pronoun use. And um, I wasn't, I had already left the rally, um, but Jordan had come back outside and so, and so that happened. Um, but when I saw that video on YouTube, I think that's when it hit me and when I really felt like I, I, get what you, I, I watched that and I felt like I get what you're saying on this side and I get what you're saying on this side and that's what motivated me to um, to make a new film but also I, I couldn't continue making the film I was making at that point. I mean it would have been ridiculous to uh, focus on Charles and Jordan's friendship when there's all this insane stuff happening in Jordan's life and it was just too much to fit into one film. Um, so it was kind of by necessity, but I would say that was the moment, and it was probably, you know, two weeks in or so from from those videos being released. The moment for me was when I shared a petition to uh, not have Jordan get fired from University of Toronto. It was really early on; like it was like a week or two after the student group, the one who held that rally, uh, put the petition out, and uh, I, I don't think I uh, even. I mean, Jordan bring up, brought up some good points, and it's it's good to have kind of like a more of a out outlier guy 
talk about things that make society question. So I like that about it, but about specifically what he said, I don't know if I fully agree, but I definitely agree with the idea that you should be allowed to say what you want to say, especially if you're a prof, if you're not inciting violence. Um, so that's why I, I shared the position. And then when I did that, friends of mine got annoyed at me. They were started giving me a hard time about it. They were telling me about this guy that I actually know, <laughs> Jordan Peterson, who lives just in our neighborhood at the time. And she was at the rally and told me what happened. But these guys, who had nothing to do, and some of them don't even live in Toronto, but I've known forever, were giving me a hard time for sharing it because they knew more about it than I did. And I'm like, okay, well, you're talking like an ideologue right now. You're talking like somebody who has it figured out and is not really listening to what I'm saying, but just waiting for your chance to speak. So then I start thinking, okay, this is, this is like very passionate for some people. These guys on my wall, on my Facebook wall, that have known me for so long, giving me a hard time for sharing this, so imagine how other people are gonna think. So I'm like, okay, this is the time to make a new film because it was just so opinionated. A lot of people have opinions about what happened here and um, there was no room to talk about a friendship with the Carver, you know? So that's when I think I realized that we need to make a new film. Thank you very much. Hey, I'm sorry, I missed your name on, from the Texas State group. From, are you with the Texas State uh, Conservative Group? Are you asking what yes. my name is or yes. the group? <laughs> Your name. <laughs> Peter Safari. Peter, I wanted to say thank you for organizing and bringing this here. And I know Austin can sometimes be a hard place to have a conservative <laughs> college group. So I hope you got it. Thank you for everything you're doing here. Thank you. And then the other thing was the holding space. I'm so glad you brought that to our attention, the name of it. I hadn't really noticed it or taken note of it until you mentioned it. And I think it's beautiful. <laughs> And I was wondering what your next big project might be, what you're going to take on in that holding space. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next film will be Mehala. It will be this film about Charles and uh, Jordan that, you know, we for a year and a half we were following and we have this incredible footage of a sacred potlatch ceremony in Charles's community. So this is in the big house. There's a big bonfire in the middle. All these community members travel to get there. and. Jordan is being blanketed and you know dancing around this fire so there's all this it's so different from all of this and uh, that's a story that we want to go back and finish um, I'll let Mass talk about another project on, in the works so here's a project with, with make, might make some of y'all uncomfortable but that's kind of why we want to do it uh, so early on in the film we uh, thought the film was going to talk a bit more about gender and all that so we uh, found this doctor in Alberta, of all places, who has the only lab in the world that studies third genders in indigenous communities around the world. Mm -hmm. So we flew him to Toronto and did an interview with him. This guy's really interesting. So basically, the gist is, is that he specifically looks at Samoa. In Samoa, before colonization, before those folks ever saw a white person, they had three gender categories, men, women, and what's called Fafafina. Fafafina are natal males, but they dress as women and wear makeup. Now, the reason that they've been uh, kind of been able to survive throughout the, 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 the history is because they're usually the ones that take care of their siblings' children. And mind you, Samoa is like a lot of places. It's very homophobic. Like, it's not, it's not like... So there's this third category where it's just such a 180 because men and women date Fafafina and it's not a gay thing. It's just like completely different. So when you're at a bar, yeah, people say, you know, they break it down into three groups. So it's a completely different way to think that falls outside of the Abrahamic tradition, falls outside of the kind of Western canon because when you go into these Polynesian and other uh, communities is that the way they think about gender is completely different. So here's what I like about this film that we want to do, that we hope to get funding for. The curveball for the right-wingers is that, okay, outside of the Judeo-Christian tradition, yes, there is a degree to which gender is a social construct, and these folks have a completely different relationship to gender than what we're used to. So it's so, that, so that's like, you know, facts don't care about your feelings. Well, here's a fact. Let's go to Samoa, how, how they behave. And mind you, again, they're, they're totally homophobic. Like, this isn't like, it's illegal to be gay. And they were like that before they were colonized. Curveball for the left wingers, which you guys are gonna like. Uh, the curveball for the left wingers is as such: the Fafafina don't care about pronouns, 
they don't want to do top surgery, they, they, don't, they don't do anything with hormones or anything like that, they don't want to play sports with women. They see a lot of this stuff that's happening in the West is completely ridiculous. And of course it has something to do with the fact that they're accepted and traditionally in their society. So I just love these curveballs, you know, it's like if you want to be, again it's about the border, right? It's just like, okay, you thought you knew it, you thought you had it figured out, oh by the way, let's take a trip. Here's how these people live. And that's a project that I'm excited about because, again, I just love that trickster kind of like, I'm going to say what you didn't expect, <laughs> so you better listen to my sentences until I'm finished, you know? Can't wait to see it. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was really moving. Um, much of, of the interesting things online that George has done is specifically the debates with Sam Harris around spirituality. Is any of that his wisdom? And so many of his YouTube videos, of course, from back in the Bible. Are you going to capture any of that in the next one? Because it was absent here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, obviously that was a potential. It's probably a bigger subject than you probably put it. But will that be captured in, in this next one? I mean, that since people, a lot of people ask that. They feel like that's a big part of Jordan's career that we didn't touch. Part of the reason was because um, the footage that we had had a lot to do with what was happening in Toronto. And we just never had a, any kind of connection with Sam Harris. Um, but, thinking out loud, could be something interesting here for Mephala. Because Mephala is, is, is it, okay, so Mephala, I'll tell you a little story. There's a scene that Patricia has, she's in the back, Jordan and Charles are going to a Truth and Reconciliation uh, conference in Ottawa, and that's kind of like talking about these past traumas, right? Because they were sanctioned by the governments, and a lot of them were Christian schools. Christian missionaries that would go out into the country. And uh, so Charles has this really awkward relationship with Christianity because of what happened. So here's this little line, right? Charles, Jordan asked him on, on tape, Jordan asked, what was the hardest thing about what happened? And, uh, and Charles says it was the smell. It was the smell of white people. Because he would be taken into a room called Bible study, but there isn't a Bible in it. He would be taken to his dark room and he's getting molested in there. He closes his eyes and tries to shut it out. His other senses get heightened. And he's sitting there with Jordan, a guy coming out of Harvard. Very, very different. Charles at the time is quite illiterate. He's texting with us now, but he's, 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 he's been working away at that. So they're very different people. And Jordan is Charles's first white friend. So it's this really beautiful, honest conversation. And I think that is actually the true path of healing and reconciliation, when you're able to kind of form these independent relationships that are kind of outside of the internet and outside of committees and all that. Um, and that there could be, so there's an interesting thing about talking about Christianity with how Jordan sees it and how Charles experienced it that could be interesting, and then tying that in with athe the New Atheist Movement and St. Harris and those guys could be an interesting thing, so if we can get a hold of that guy, Sam Harris. I just literally just thought about that on the spot. <laughs> well, definitely there won't be themes about religion in that film. Um, and yeah, there are so many things that ended up on the cutting room floor in this film. Um, and I remember when Jordan was starting his series on the psychological significance of the biblical stories, he said to me, I think this might be the biggest thing I'll ever do. Um, and so, and we were, we filmed that series, so, you know, we were, we were there throughout all of that, and, um, yeah, it, it was because we ended up focusing on Jordan Peterson, the person, and this kind of intimate look throughout this tumultuous period, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that ended up on the cutting room floor, um, but, um, yeah, people have been asking about it, so it'll, it'll end up somewhere. <laughs> We have time for one more quick question, if anyone has one. If not, wrap it up here. Uh, relevant follow-up question, I think there, you've been talking about the two documentaries. Uh, roughly how much footage uh, did you capture yet uh, for each one of those two documentaries? And, um, I've got a second part after that. Yeah. Um, yeah, people have been asking this, and I should probably count how much it is. I mean, hundreds of hours is, is what I can generally say. Too much. <laughs> a lot, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess the, the last question I have is, I can only imagine how challenging it is to be a husband and wife 
team. Uh, uh -huh. and, and, and it's a wonderful, wonderful film. I, I guess you should reiterate. What was one of the more challenging, uh, uh, maybe disagreements you might have had in the process, and how did you resolve it? Well, firstly, I structured everything so that I would have the final say in all the creation on this. Smart man. Smart man. Yeah, smart man. I was trying to establish the patriarchy in the house. <laughs> <laughs> we actually quite like working together, so that's pretty good. We're both the kind of people that um, we're very passionate about what we do, so it becomes our world. So luckily, that works out. And we actually only got married like two months ago, so even oh, after wow. all of this, we got made it a bit easier is that like this is a project Patricia initiated Jordan Peterson is a guy that she's been following for a long time I met Jordan very differently and I keep I, I would just say his first name and, you know I, I met him just as a guy who really lived in our neighborhood and we just kind of chatted up about day-to-day -day kind of things and uh, you know and my impression with him was very much like uh, he's kind of a bit of a problem solver and it makes sense that his psychology is a clinical one where I'd be having a problem at work or something that's on my mind I can't quite figure out and he would he would buckle down and try to figure it out with me and that was kind of my experience just as a, as a guy as a person and then as he started to get super famous I was just um, very adamantly obsessed with I didn't want to make. I didn't want to be part of a project that made things worse, that deviated toward away from raw truth and pandered to anybody. I just hate the feeling of looking back at my career and, and finding something that I pandered to people to get them to like me or get them get them get money, right? Um, so I'm happy Patricia never did that, and um, and I'm happy that she had the reins on this because she I think she did a really really good job and really ethical. The way she cut it. Okay. So you lived by him? Yeah, so uh, at the time, so uh, it's, it's called the Annex. It's a neighborhood near campus UFT in Toronto, and uh, we lived uh, at the time, we now uh, bought our own place a bit uh, away. It's downtown, it's pretty expensive in Toronto, but we lived uh, pretty close to the end. We'd bike over to his place and give him a hard time. <laughs> yeah, he said a uh, cute little thing he said that you guys might like. Um, we were somewhere in between uh, house plants, or no, no, we were somewhere in between Japanese tourists and family. <laughs> we just kind of be in there, we're small, so we're just in the room. <laughs> so put the lab on first, then we won't talk to you again. So, yes, we got one more over here. All right. Our <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm being a pig. Um, to me, the most important one, if I could choose one thing that's important about Jordan, it is that he, he says that civil, Western Civil got you know, a few things wrong, but the most important thing that it got right was the presence of uh, the spark of the divine in every individual, which goes against the tribalism. And I would love to have that somehow come out because I didn't see it in, in maybe in your promotional stuff because he says it lots of times. Yeah, we actually have a clip of that that we kind of released on ThinkSpot. ThinkSpot is this, it's Jordan's uh, social media site and we were creators on that, so we're releasing some of the footage that we didn't make it and everything. And just to kind of echo what you're saying, like I was born in Iran and my family came as refugees to Canada during the war. And what happened in Iran in the 80s is that it was all about collective thought, it was all about the the dissolving the individual and uh, self-policing. So I'm I'm a product man of how I, this part of the world just got several things right, and um, and so I echo that for sure. So I understand how important that is, especially again I understand how important it is because I know the East. So if you're in the West and you want to talk about how great it is, you can't really do that without knowing these. So I think that, that again, that speaks to the border blending that I think is really important for creators. Um, but yeah, the, the, what you're talking about, we have certain clips of it that we'll release on ThinkSpot. And then I would also add to that and say, a lot of that stuff that you're talking about, and I think somebody says this every screening, is that 
oh, this, what about this? And that's really important is that we, we agree. It's just that it's already out there. Either Jordan himself on YouTube or uh, uh, if you ever heard of